Welcome, gentlemen, to students to the homework help video, page 158, numbers 1 through 26, 29, and 32 through 36. Let's go ahead and get started. Here we go. Uh, numbers 1 through 4. Uh, number 1 says, in a coordinate plane, sketch a quadrilateral that's a four-sided figure that has y-axis symmetry but not x-axis symmetry. So, uh, pretty, simple to, uh, pretty simple to do, actually, students. Um, here's our coordinate plane right here. And this is our, our y-axis here, this is our x-axis here. We're going to draw a quadrilateral that has y-axis symmetry, but not x-axis symmetry. So, uh, pretty, there's many ways you can do this. First of all, you could draw a um, square like this, or a rectangle, excuse me, a rectangle like this, that is centered around the y-axis, but not around the x-axis x-axis that would work right there that's a four-sided figure <clears throat> this is a four-sided figure right here and notice the y-axis uh, splits it right in half but the x-axis does not so this uh, rectangle right here has y-axis symmetry but it does not have x-axis symmetry now it would have x-axis symmetry if it was slid down to here then it would have x-axis symmetry okay so there's one example, and there's many other types of examples you could draw. Okay, all right. Now, number two, what is wrong with the statement, the area of the region is 25 yards? Well, the problem with that statement, students, is this. Area is always square yards, or square feet, or square inches, or whatever the situation, <coughs> situation might be. So area is measured in square yards. Uh, moving on to number three, the point X is between W and Y. Is it true then that WX and WY are collinear? Well, we've talked about this, students, very thoroughly. Anytime in geometry we use the word between when referring to points, that does mean that the points are collinear. So yes, all of these points are collinear, okay? X is between W and Y. So here's W, here's X, and here's Y. When we say X is between W and Y, that does mean they're collinear. Now, does that mean that X is right smack dab in the middle of W and Y? not at all. X could be, this point could be, this point could be over here, okay? And X is still between W and Y. So it does not mean that X is right in the middle of them, but it does mean it's between them, and it does mean that all those points are collinear. Yes, definitely. Okay, number four. Give a counterexample. <clears throat> give a counterexample to prove that the following statement is false. Well, it's a true statement when it says that x equals negative 2. That's, that's a true statement. The problem is it doesn't give all of the answers. It's true that negative 2 works. Here's x. If you put negative 2 in for x and square it, <clears throat> you will get 4, okay? However, there's another answer also, and obviously that answer is 2. So when it says if x squared equals 4, then x equals negative 2, that's not necessarily true. A counterexample would be this right here, x equals 2, okay? Because 2 also works. So there's your counterexample, okay? Number 5, now look, angle E is congruent to an angle, and F's congruent to an angle. If this happens, then E is congruent to G. Now think about this, guys. It should be pretty, pretty obvious we're looking at transitive here. Look, if I put angle F right here, and then right here I put angle G, see if that makes sense. E is congruent to F, F's congruent to G, Thus, E is congruent to G. And that's true. It's called transitive property. Okay? So what you're looking for is 
angle F and angle G, which is what which is what I wrote here. Okay. All right. Moving on to number six. CD equals AB, and if if CD equals AB, then AB equals CD. Okay, and we call that ref, uh, symmetric, the symmetric property. Okay, all right, number seven, the statement RS is congruent to RS is what? Well, first of all, we know it's reflexive. Okay, anytime you have the same thing set equal to itself or the same thing congruent to itself, we know that's the reflexive property. Now, is it the reflexive property of congruence? Or is it the reflexive property of equality? Well, do we have an equal sign here or a congruent sign here? Congruent. So it's called the reflexive property of congruence. Okay? All right, number eight. Here is line P, y equals 2x plus 6. Okay? So here it is. And a line parallel to P goes through this point right here. we want to find a line that's parallel to this line because it says right here a line parallel to P and passes through this point here. So we're looking for a linear equation that is parallel to this line here and passes through this point here. So students hopefully you remember by now anytime you're writing a linear equation you want a, po a point you want the slope and you have to use this formula right here okay so the point is given to us the point is 0 0 and the slope we know because the slope of this line here notice y is all by itself thus the x coefficient um, will be your, is the slope of this line so the slope of the line you're looking for would also be 2 because parallel lines have the same slope so we have a point, we have the slope, now let's use our formula. So here's my x, my y, and my m. So for y, I'm going to substitute 0. For m, I'm going to substitute 2. For x, I'm going to substitute 0. 2 times 0 is 0, so 0 equals 0 plus b. And of course, 0 plus b is just b, so 0 equals b. So look, students, you know your b, you know your m, so write your equation. If I can get my pen to work here, your equation would be y equals, and then put your slope, 2x, and then plus b, plus 0. Now, of course, you, you can put the plus 0. That's totally fine. But you don't have to put the plus 0 if you don't want to, okay? So it's totally up to you. All right, number 9. Skew lines are lines that do not intersect and they do not lie in the same plane. Very important you understand that, okay? Parallel lines do not intersect, but they do lie in the same plane, all right? Number 10, if angles 1 and 2 are complementary, then 1 plus 2 equals, that's pretty easy, guys, 90 degrees, okay? All right. Moving on to numbers 11 through 16. Now, let's see. Let's go through and do the ones we know first and then use process of elimination, okay? For example, number 14 is really obvious. Array from C to D. Well, I only see, I only see one ray emblem up here. It's E. Now, F looks like a ray, but F is a, is a um, vector, okay? So, number 14, um, array... Uh, from C to D would be E, ray C, D. Now let's go on to the vector real quick. We have vector C, D. So look at number 12. Vector from C to D is vector C, D. Okay? So there we go. Now a line through C, D. Well, letter A. I mean, I see no other line symbols up here. And here's my line symbol right here. So letter A is line C, D, so that would be letter number 15, line C, D, okay? Now, let me draw an angle for you real quick. Please don't miss this, okay? Th this angle here would be called angle what? ABC or angle 
CBA. But no matter which way you write it, notice the vertex is B, and notice the vertex is in the middle. So when it says, number 13 says, A, <clears throat> angle with vertex C, that means I'm looking for an angle over here that has C in the middle, because C is the vertex. Well, it would be right here. It, it would not be C, because that's angle CDB. It would be D, angle DCB, so letter D. Now, number 16, an angle with vertex D. That means you want an angle with D in the middle. Wouldn't that be letter C, angle CDB? So, 16 is C. And then lastly, process of elimination here. The length of segment CD is B. Now, we've not talked a lot about that, and that's my fault. Let me pull up and park here for a couple minutes. Look, when we're dealing with angles, if I say the measure of angle 1 equals 30 degrees, I put an M here, and that means the measure of angle 1, okay? Now, if I say CD like this without a segment above it like that, that means the measure of CD is whatever I want to call it, 6 inches, okay? So, that's why number 11, length of segment CD is B, just CD, not a segment. Now, listen to me carefully. If it, if it didn't say length, if it just said segment CD, then I would expect to see a line above it like this, okay? But when it says length of a segment, then we just put the letters, okay? All right, moving on. Now, students, I really don't care if you solve these <coughs> uh, using substitution or linear combination. I'm going to go back and forth and use both. I'm not going to use graphing. Graphing is really long in detail, so I'm just going to um, use a lim linear combination and substitution. So I'm probably going to go uh, linear combination, substitution, and then linear combination and substitution. Okay, so here we go. All right, number 17, if I'm going to use um, linear combination, I want either my x to eliminate or my 3 to eliminate, my y to eliminate. So I'm either going to multiply the top here by a negative 4, so that I have a negative 4x here, or I'm going to multiply the top by a negative 3, so that I have a negative 3 here. Now, students, it really doesn't matter. It's your choice, okay? I'm going to go with negative 3 for really no certain reason. So Take your negative 3 here and multiply it through, okay? Negative 3 times x is negative 3x. Negative 3 times y is negative 3y. Now watch your signs here. Be careful. Negative 3 times negative 10 is 30. And then bring down your other equation. Now go ahead and combine those together. These will cancel. Negative 3x plus 4x is 1x. And 30 plus 5 is 35, okay? Now, divide both sides by 1, and you still get 35 for x. Now, students, it does not matter <coughs> where you substitute 35. You can put it in for x here, or here, or here, or here. It just doesn't matter, okay? I'm going to take the top equation. That looks like it's the easiest. So I'm going to take the top equation x plus y equals negative 10, and where x is, I'm going to put 35. And I'll bring the 35 over and make it a negative 35. And guys, I'm really not writing that sloppy. My pen is messing up, so I'm, I apologize, but so it's gone. And I'm left with y equals negative 45. So your final, final answer would be 35, negative 45, okay? Now that was linear combination. I'm going to solve the next problem using substitution. Now my advice to you is get rid of your fractions. I mean, think about it. Why do you want a fraction in one of these problems? So look at your denominator. Your denominator is 3. You can multiply an equation by anything as long as you do it to everything in that equation. So I'm going to take this top equation here, and I'm going to multiply it by 3 just to get rid of that fraction, okay? I don't want that fraction there, okay? So, 
3 over 1. <coughs> 3 over 1 times 1 over 3 gives me 1y. 3 times x gives me 3x. And 3 times 4 gives me 12. That's a lot nicer, okay? Then I have negative y, negative 3x, equals negative 2. Now, I want to solve this using substitution. So I'm looking for a variable that has no coefficient in front of it. And I see a y here that has no coefficient in front of it. And I see a y here that has no coefficient in front of it. Probably the easiest one to use is the y that's positive. So I'm going to take this equation here. And I'm going to get y all by itself. Okay, so here we go. <clears throat> Bring the 3x over and make it a negative 3x. And please don't put 9x, okay? These are different terms. You cannot combine them. y equals 12 minus 3x. All right, now we come up here to this equation. Here's y. So where y is, I'm going to put 12 minus 3x. So I bring down my negative sign. And then here's y. Put your parentheses and put 12 minus 3x. Now, a lot of students would forget to bring this negative sign down, okay? Please don't forget to do that. Okay, continue. <clears throat> continuing on. Now, bring down your negative 3x equals a negative 2. Take your negative sign and multiply it through like this. Negative times 12 is negative 12. Negative times a negative is a positive 3x. And then bring down your negative 3x equals negative 2. Well, notice your x's cancel, so you're left with 0x. Then, bring your negative 12 over and make it a positive 12, and you're left with 10. Now, right there, you're done. You can't divide by 0. All of your x's canceled out, so you're really left with 0 equals 10. Whenever your variables cancel out and your numbers, your constant terms don't cancel out, then you know the answer is simply no solution. Now listen to me. If the answer is no solution, that means these two lines never intersect. And if they never intersect, then you know what about these two lines? You know they're parallel. Okay? So here's the answer. No solution. Okay? Moving on to number 19. All right. We're going to use linear combination. Now once again, like the last problem, I don't want this fraction here. And I notice my denominator is a 4. So I'm going to multiply this top equation by 4. Well, Mr. Earhart, would you, would you use a negative 4 because there's a negative sign there? That really doesn't matter. I would not. Because anytime you multiply a negative number through an entire equation, it really becomes quite easy to mess up your signs. So I'm just going to multiply a 4, <coughs> a four through, OK? so. Uh, 4 times y is 4y. 4 times negative 1 fourth is negative 1x, or negative x. And then 4 times 2 is 8. So there's your top equation. Now your bottom equation is negative 4y plus x equals negative 8. So I took the top equation and I multiplied it by 4 to get rid of this fraction. And look what happened. This problem really fell into place nicely. Look at this. If I add these together, these cancel. These cancel. And these cancel. So unlike the last problem, the last problem, my x's canceled out. But my, constant, my constant terms did not. In this problem, my x's cancel out and my constant terms. So when that happens, we say the answer is infinite solutions. And the reason that is, if you're wondering, Mr. Earhart, how can two lines intersect infinitely? I thought that two lines could only <clears throat> intersect in one place. Well, you're right. But if you were to graph these two lines, you would see they would fall right on top of each other. They're identical lines. They have the exact same graph. Okay, thus, we call that infinite solutions. Okay, all right, uh, number 20. And this, uh, 
this cumulative review is, is really good for you guys. Very, very good, okay? All right, let's go with um, the substitution method. I'm looking for a variable that does not have a coefficient. Well, this x does not have a coefficient, so I'm going to get x all by itself. x equals negative 1. Bring this 6y over and make it negative minus 6y. Okay, now go into the other equation, 2x plus 7y equals 3. And where the x is, I'm going to substitute negative 1 minus 6y. So I brought down my 2, and where the x is, I substituted negative 1 minus 6y because x equals negative 1 minus 6y. Okay, now let's solve this equation for y. Take your 2 and multiply it through. So 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. 2 times negative 6 <coughs> is negative 12y. Then bring down your 7y equals 3. Okay, now combine your y terms negative 12y and 7y is negative 5y. Bring your negative 2 over, make it a positive 2, and you're left with 5. Divide both sides by negative 5, and 5 divided by negative 5 is negative 1. Now, come over here and where the y is, put your negative 1. So x equals negative 1, negative 6, negative 1. So x equals negative 1, positive 6. Because a negative 6 times a negative 1 <coughs> is a positive 6. And now combine those and you will get 5. So your ordered pair is 5, negative 1. There we go. Okay, moving on. Numbers 21 through 26. Okay, number 21. Show that line 1 is parallel to line 3. Well, here's line 1 and here's line 3. Okay? They have the same slope, guys. What is the slope of line one? Three halves. What is the slope of line three? Three halves. So the answer to 21 is just, they have the same slopes. There we go, they're parallel. Okay, number 22. Show that line one is parallel or perpendicular to line two. Okay, no problem. Um, here's, <coughs> here's line one. Here's line two. Look at their slopes. One slope is three halves, and the other slope is negative two thirds. Now look, first of all, for these two lines to be perpendicular, they have to have opposite signs. And do they have opposite signs? Yes. This one here is positive, and this one here is negative. Secondly, the two slopes have to be flipped or reciprocals of each other, and they are. <clears throat> this is 3 halves, and this is 2 thirds. So, the answer for 23 would be they have slopes are opposite reciprocals. Okay? Number 23. Show that line 3 and line 2 are perpendicular. Well, I'm not going to go through that um, same explanation again. For number 23, you're welcome to put um, something like this. C answer from number 22, because they're the exact same answer. I mean, look, here's your slope from, here's your um, e uh, linear equation for line 2, here's your linear equation for line 3, here's your slope, here's your slope, okay? So there you go. Okay. Moving on to number 24. I think 24, guys, is a typo. I think it's a mistake because it says show that line 1 is parallel to line 4. And I have looked all over my book here for line 4. And my book, my book does not have line 4. Okay? So, oh, here it is. I see it now. My fault. Okay, line 4 is parallel to line 3. Okay? All right, no problem. Okay, so look what we have here. Okay, number 21 says line 1 is parallel to line 3. Now look at your directions. It says line 4 is parallel to line 3. So line 4 is parallel to line 3. 
So how do we know that line 1 is parallel to line 4? Guys, it's called the transitive property of parallel lines. Remember, if line 1 is parallel to line 3, and line 4 <coughs> is parallel to line 3, that means line 1 and line 4 are parallel to the same line. Thus, they have to be parallel also. So line 1 is parallel to line 4. So what would you put for an answer? Um, I would put line 1 and line 4 are parallel to the same line. That's what I would put. Line 1 and line 4 are parallel to the same line. Okay? Alright, moving on to number uh, 25. It says find PR. Well, this will be interesting. Let's see here. Um, oh, okay. In your instructions, you will see it says uh, P is 5, 0. If you'll look in your book, you'll see this in your instructions. Okay, P is 5, 0, and R is 4, 4. So when it says find PR, let's go back a couple pages here. You remember what that means? Look right here look at number 11 the length of segment CD is just symbolized by CD so when you see just PR that means the length of PR so the length of PR will be the distance formula and the distance formula is X minus X quantity squared plus Y minus Y quantity squared so very quickly here x minus x, 5 minus 4 would be 1 squared, plus y minus y, that's 0 minus 4, so negative 4 squared. Well, 1 times 1 is 1, plus 4 times 4 is 16, and 1 plus 16 is the square root of 17. And that is, if you look right here, that is the correct answer, okay? Alright, uh, moving on to number 26. 26 says to represent the, uh, vector RP as an ordered pair. Okay, so it's understood when R comes first, RP, this is your initial point, P is the second letter, so this is your terminal point. Now, do you, do you remember how to find, um, to write a vector as an ordered pair? You take the terminal point minus the, the initial point, okay? So here's your terminal point minus your initial point. So 5 minus 4 is 1 and 0 minus 4 is negative 4. 0 minus 4 and negative 4. So there you wrote vector RP as an ordered pair. Okay, moving on. Okay, now number 29 says rewrite the statements to fit the follow pattern, the following pattern. P, so that P implies Q, so that Q implies R, so that R implies S, so that S implies T. Now students, look. I mean, it sounds confusing, but you know what it's saying? It's just saying put these in order. And we've done this before. That's all that it's saying. Now, look, to put these in order, I don't want to have some not type of conditional statements and then some conditional statements that don't have the word not, okay? That's not going to help. I want them to all have nots, N-O-T-S, or all of them not to. So what I did is I wrote the contrapositive of, the, of this one, and I wrote the contrapositive of this one. Now, in case you've forgotten, contrapositives do two things. Two things. First of all... <clears throat> First of all, contrapositives swap the if and the then parts, the hypothesis and the conclusion. Secondly, they change it. Um, if it's if there's if there's not a not, then you put one in. If there is one, you take it away. So I've got to take this word away and take this word away, and then swap the hypothesis and the conclusion. Same thing here. I've got to take the not away. I've got to take the not away and then swap places. If you do that correctly, you'll get this. There it is. If Kevin plays the clarinet, then Sam, sorry about that, Sam, there you go, plays the drums. If Kelly plays the guitars, then Tony plays the saxophone. Okay, so that's the first thing you have to do. Now next, I have to put these in 
order. Now here's how I do it. I always just start with the first one and put it first and then see if something can come after it and, and kind of work my way down until I get to the end. So that's what I did. So here's what I did. I, I next, <clears throat> I numbered all of these statements. One, two, three, four, five. And then I put um, statement number one first, like this. So statement number one reads, if Kevin plays the clarinet, then Sam plays the drums. So now I'm looking for a statement that says, if Sam plays the drums. Here it is right here, number three. So three would come next. So if I put three next, then it says this. If Sam plays the drums, then Kelly plays the guitar. So now I'm looking for a statement that starts off with, if Kelly plays the guitar. Let's see. Here it is, statement two. So I would put two next. All right, so here we go. Statement two says, if Kelly plays the guitar, then Tony plays the saxophone. So now I'm looking for a statement that says, if Tony plays the saxophone. Well, that's number four. So I put four next, okay? Now, last is five. Notice, now please listen carefully. Look at number 29. They asked you to put P first. P. Well, P is just a statement, okay? And then P implies Q, Q implies R, R implies S, and S implies T. Okay, so since they want P to come first, or just your, or just your statement, then what they want is, is they want five to come first. So let's read this, and let's see if it makes sense. Okay, here we go. Kevin plays the clarinet. That's number five. Okay, then if Kevin plays the clarinet, then Sam plays the drums. Number three, if Sam plays, I'll put check marks here, okay? Number three, if Sam plays the drums, then Kelly plays the guitar, okay? If Kelly plays, plays the guitar, then Tony plays the saxophone, okay? If Tony plays the saxophone, then Sheila sings. There we go. We did it. We put it in order, okay? We put our statement first. And then all of our conditional statements were put in order. So, Kevin does play the clarinet. So I can go all the way down to the end. I can say that number four, Sheila sings. And now look at your next question. Sheila was hoping to sing. Does she? Yes. If Kevin does not play the clarinet, would Sheila maybe still sing anyways? A lot of you would like to put what for an answer here? No, but hold on a second. You might not mean to, but you're assuming the converse is true. And remember, converses are not always true, guys. Okay? Look, we know for sure that if Kevin plays the clarinet, then um, <clears throat> Sam will play the drums. And if Sam plays the drums, Kelly will play the guitar, and if Kelly plays the guitar, then Tony will play the saxophone. And if Tony plays the saxophone, then Sheila sings. So we know for sure if Kevin plays the clarinet, then Sheila will sing. But nowhere does it say that if he doesn't, then she won't. Nowhere, okay? So no, you cannot make the assumption that she won't. Might she... <clears throat> Uh, might she still sing anyways? Yeah, she might. We don't know for sure. Okay. If it said, if Kevin does not play the clarinet, do we know for sure she'll sing? No, we don't know for sure, but she might. We really have no way to say no. We have no reason to say no, she wouldn't. She might or she might not. Okay, we don't know. All right, moving on. Uh, number 33. Now, number 33. Notice I cut part of the picture out here. What I'm going to do next is this, students, I'm going to do something that's going to help you. I'm going to go ahead and, and draw the, uh, these lines like this and extend them and make them a little longer. And, and then I'm going to get rid of the picture. The picture is really in the way, okay? There. Now that's what I have, okay? Now, Notice, this is A, this is B, this is C, this is, this is D, and this is E, okay? Now, 
let's look at what they want us to do here, okay? They want us to prove something. Statements, reasons. Now remember, what I've taught you to do, you take your given and you mark it over here, okay? So, angle B, A, C. So here's B, A, C. So this angle here, I'm going to call it angle 1 to make it easier. It's congruent to angle D, E, C. So here's D, here's E, and here's C. Congruent. Okay, and we're going to call that angle 2. So the first thing I did is what I've taught you to do. You pick up your given and you put it on the picture. Now we're trying to prove that A, B here is parallel to D, E. Well, we know what to do first, students. We know to list our given first. So number 1, angle 1 is congruent <clears throat> number angle one is congruent to angle two and that's our given now Mr. Earhart that's not what your your given setup here that's true but I went ahead and used numbers aren't numbers a lot easier they really are okay so I'm going to call angle BAC angle one and angle DEC number two now you're not allowed to do this okay I'm just kidding with you, of course. You're welcome to do that, all right? It's totally fine. If it makes the proofs a little easier for you, that's fine. Now, guys, I, I just copied down. These two angles are congruent. We're basically done. Look, get rid of this line right here. Okay, watch this. I'm going to get rid of this line right here. Here we go. Okay, wow, what's what skills I have there? Alright, now look. You have two lines cut by a transversal. Guys, that's that's why I got rid of this picture right here. The picture's in the picture's in the way, okay? Look, what are these two angles called? You've got <clears throat> students, you've got to know by now what these two angles are called. You have to. They're called alternate interior angle. So I'm going to put this. I'm going to state that angles 1 and 2 are what? Alternate interior angles. I'm going to state that. And how do I know that? Definition of alternate interior angles. And now that I've stated that they're alternate interior angles, I have angles 1 and 2 are congruent their alternate interior angles so I can state that line AP is parallel to line DE. That's one of our ways. Guys, we've we've learned four about six ways ways to prove that lines are parallel. And one of them is if two lines are cut by a transversal so that alternate interior angles are congruent, then the lines are parallel. So I can state a, B is parallel to D, E. Why? Because the alternate interior angles are what? Congruent. That's a real small, easy three-step proof, okay? Okay, moving on to number, um, number 34. Okay, real quick here. I'm going to go ahead and do this again. Let's get rid of the picture here and then also students I'm gonna go ahead and cut and paste this so I can use it for the next uh, the next um, proof we're gonna do also hold on one second here okay now let's go back over here all right here we go now um, what did I have here was it a a b c a b c d e okay here we go so we have A, B, C, D, and E. Okay, now, remember students, pick up your given 
and put your given on the diagram. So AC is congruent to CB. So one slash here, one slash here, okay? DC, two slashes, is congruent to CE. So two slashes here. And we're going to prove that this whole segment here, AE, is congruent to this whole segment here. And by the way, that's common sense. Look, pretend the length of AC was 6. Well, that would mean this length over here is 6 also. Pretend the length of DC is 8. Well, that would mean this length here is also 8. Well, 6 plus 8 is 14. 6 plus 8 is 14. This whole segment here would be 14. This whole segment here would be 14. So it makes sense that AE is congruent to BD. We still got to come up with a plan of attack, though, okay? So here's my plan of attack. I'm thinking segment addition. Okay, let me show you. Now, students, let me show you what I mean here. Okay, watch this. Remember, right now we're just brainstorming, okay? Well, look, if I take AC plus CE, I get AE. Do I not? Look, if I take AC plus CE, I get the whole segment AE. Okay, that's pretty obvious. Now, let's look at this, this segment over here. If I take BC plus CD, I get BD. Look, if I take BC plus CD, I get the whole segment BD. That's called segment addition. We've talked about that, okay? Okay, now, Mr. Earhart, why is that a big deal? Are you kidding? Look, look at this. Look, and you're given. What does AC equal? CB. So what can I put for AC right? Well, for BC right here, what can I put? I can put AC. Look at CD right here. What does CD equal? CE. So right here, I could put CE. Look what I have. I have transitive. I have AE equals, or let's say substitution. I have AC plus CE equals this. And I also have AC plus CE equals this. So I can pick up BD and I can put it right here in place of this and I'll have BD equals AE, which is what I'm trying to prove. So I think that my brainstorming is great. It looks good. So here we go. Statements, reasons. Okay, number one, AC is congruent to CB. And DC is congruent to CE. That's your given. Now, students, please learn this. Listen to me. First of all, we cannot make substitutions, okay, with congruent symbols. You cannot do it. Let me say that again. You cannot make substitutions with, congru with congruent symbols. And I, I just showed you <clears throat> during our brainstorming that we're going to have to make some substitutions. So, we better first of all convert these congruent symbols over to equal size. So, real quick. AC equals CB, DC equals CE. How can I do that? Well, definition. Definition of congruent segments. Okay, if they're congruent, then they're also equal. Now, segment addition. Remember I showed you segment, segment addition. AC, this right here, plus CE. Okay? equals the entire segment AE. And I'm going to go ahead and squeeze this in. BC plus CD. Okay? BC plus CD equals the entire segment BD. And that, of course, is segment addition. Now, how about substitution? Look. For AC right here, I'm going to put CB. 
plus for CE right here I'm going to put DC equals AE that's called substitution and now students I'm so close to being done look substitution again look what do I have right here I'm going to change colors look what do I have right here AC plus CE equals AE what do I have right here I have uh, hold on one second I circled the wrong thing I think I did sorry hold on um, yes look what I have right here BC plus CD equals BD then look what I have here I have the same thing BC which is CB same thing CD same thing as DC so I have I have CB plus DC equals AE so I can pick this up right here and I can substitute it in for this right here perfectly actually so AE equals BD now look how close we are you're trying to prove that AE is congruent to BD we have them equal so our last step is easy segment AE <coughs> is congruent to segment BD and what are, oh, I didn't put our reason over here sorry about that number five should be substitution because we substituted again we picked up AE and we put it in for BC plus CD now six once again we converted from equal sign up here we converted from congruent signs to equal signs okay down here we converted from equal signs to congruent signs so once again same thing definition of congruent segments if, if segments are equal they're also congruent and we did it we're done okay so one more problem and we're done with this cumulative review here we go all right I went ahead and drew the green lines let's get, let's get rid of this picture and let's quickly put our points up here a B C D E okay now you're given a B is parallel to D E okay so remember you pick up your given and you mark it so I'm gonna put an arrow here and, and an arrow here there now I'm trying to prove let's give these let's give these angles some numbers to make it a little easier okay angle a b c so a b c angle one you're trying to prove this angle here is congruent to angle c d e c d e angle two well students I gotta be honest with you this is this is easy as number 33 was look I'm gonna brainstorm real quick here I'm gonna get rid of this line here uh, just to get rid of distractions here so we can see a little better what we're dealing with look at that I have two parallel lines cut by a transversal and you're like Mr. Earhart you're a little too excited about that yeah I guess I do but um look guys two parallel lines cut by a transversal we have a theorem or a postulate that says <clears throat> if two parallel lines are cut by a transversal then their alternate interior angles are congruent and we have alternate interior angles so there's really no brainstorming to do it's statements reasons number one is your given so a B is parallel to D E that's, that's your given okay number two we have to state what angles one and two are so angles one and two are what they are alternate interior angles how do I know that by definition of alternate interior angles okay and then lastly number three guys I'm done look at your statements yes or no did you state that a and b and, and d and e are parallel yes right here okay 
did you state that angles one and two are alternate interior? Yes, right here. Well, then you're you're ready to state that angle one is congruent to angle two, and the reason would be alternate interior angles are congruent when you're dealing with what? Parallel lines. That's supposed to be lines. It doesn't look like it, but it looks like lieg, but it's lines, okay? All right. Now, guys, I hope you have a great uh, rest of the day. I hope this has made sense. This has been a really good, solid, cumulative review, okay? If you have any questions, uh, contact me, call or email.